Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second in our series of Wild Isles webinars. This one is called A Tale of Talons, a bird's eye view of the white-tailed eagle and the golden eagle. This webinar is an hour long with talks and videos from our experts, um, and then we'll give you the chance to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, my name is Martin Fowley, and um, I work at the RSPB in the uh, communications team. And today I have the amazing job of introducing our speakers. But first, I would like to um, just get some online housekeeping to make you aware of. So um, as this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphone, but you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now, we may not get time to answer all people's questions during the session, but we will do our best to get back to you at a future date if you haven't asked it anonymously. But please don't wait until right at the end of the presentations to ask your questions, but pop them in the Q&A box as soon as you think of them. And to help us know who the question is for, please put the speaker's name at the beginning of your question. Uh, also, just want to let you know um, that this webinar is being recorded. There will also be some polls this afternoon, um, and these will pop up on your screen automatically. And it would be great if you could just um, answer, but you don't have to absolutely um, do that if you don't want to. Um, we'll also have a survey at the end of the uh, seminar, which will also pop up on your screen automatically once the webinar has ended. And we'd, you know, obviously be great, and we'd really appreciate to get your feedback on the webinar in order just to make these things better each time. But also, you know, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Um, if you have any technical issues, there is someone from the events team with us today who may be able to help, although for some Zoom related issues, we may not be able to offer the right sort of support. Now, our speakers this afternoon are Dave Sexton, who will be presenting on white-tailed eagles, and Ian Thompson, who will be presenting on golden eagles. Now, before I introduce Dave, just as a sort of practice thing, we're going to have a quick poll for you. So, um, and we'll give you a minute to answer. So the first question is, um, might seem a little Mickey Mouse, but just a good sort of baseline one. Um, did you know you could see eagles in the UK? So pop your answer in there if you'd like to. And then when we're ready, we can share the results just to get an idea. So almost exclusively everyone knew um, we could see eagles in the UK. So that's a good place to start. And you're obviously in the right place in order to find out a little bit more about the two eagle species that we're going to talk uh, about today. Now, let's introduce our first speaker. Um, Dave Sexton has worked for the RSPB for 35 years and has been RSPB's mull officer for over 20. Now, David first went to Mull uh, and saw a sea eagle in 1980 and always knew that he wanted to work there and work with this you know, incredibly special bird. Um, so just once again, before I hand over to Dave, we have another poll on white-tailed eagles. And again, we'll give you a minute just to answer that. So the question is, do we think that white-tailed eagles should be reintroduced more widely across the UK? I know what I think, but let you guys make up your minds on that as well. And then when we have the uh, answer, we can... So most of you think... Um, most of you think they should. Well, that, that's good too. Obviously, it obviously depends on the place and um, people really need to be involved in these things from the start. But good to know that, as on principle, many of you think that they should be because they are absolutely magnificent birds. Um, right. OK, thank you. I will now pass over to David to begin his part of the webinar. Thank you very much, Martin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a rather damp and dreek um, Isle of Mull this afternoon. Um, yeah, it's not the sort of weather for, for eagle watching, but um, 
it's nice to be indoors and, and talking to all of you uh, today. So what I'm going to do um, is talk about the return of this native bird. Um, it was once wiped out, but has been brought back. So we're going to look at the bit of history, look at what's going on today, and a look ahead to the exciting future. And I just love this first image, actually. It's by a mull photographer, Pete Walkden, of a curious, um, immature white-tailed eagle. It shows their, their curiosity and, and sometimes their approachability, too, which is what can sometimes land them in, in hot water. So just to say, you know, these birds are incredible. They they used to thrive across the United Kingdom, um, but were persecuted to extinction, really, in uh, 1918. A, a, an eagle that used to be across the United Kingdom was, was uh, threatened with extinction. And here's a quick introduction into that uh, bird. The adults top left, bottom right, uh, lovely white tail. This is a mature bird's pale head bright yellow beak and then the immature birds bottom left and top right much darker they, they don't get their adult plumage um, until you know they're nearly five years old so yes we move forward um and this is a bird that was part of our history really um there are pictish stones um from scotland that show white-tailed eagles that they were revered um and held in very high esteem. We know this is a white-tailed eagle because you can see the feathers don't go all the way down to the toes like they do on a golden eagle. Um, and also in Orkney, there's the tomb of the eagles, Neolithic tomb uh, where people were, were actually buried with white-tailed eagles. So it just shows how important they, they were to us. Uh, but having nested right from the south coast of England, right to the far north coast of Shetland, uh, they were persecuted to extinction. Uh, finally, egg collectors and muse museum collectors pretty much uh, finished them off. The last pair bred on the Isle of Skye in 1916. And if we see the next image, you know, it's a it's a, a sad image. And it's the only image of a, the original native uh, wild sea eagles. This is the last bird to exist in Britain. Um, and it it too was shot. Um, in 1918. So really just appalling what we're capable of when we set our minds to it. This is a male, very pale individual, um, and he was widowed for about 10 years before he too finally um, succumbed. So what did we do about it? Well, back at, starting in the 1960s and 70s, we can see the next image. The um, this was the end of the white-tailed eagle and people started thinking, you know, what are we going to do? How will we ever bring this bird back? So moving forward, the, some very visionary people started thinking about how this might be brought back. People like Roy Dennis, who was the RSVB's Highland officer at the time, um, and George Waterston, who was our RSVB's director in Scotland. We experimented, first of all, with bringing four birds back to Fair Isle in 1968. Um, that didn't really work. Uh, they disappeared, but we learned some lessons about how to do things in the future. And it was in 1975 that the uh, the real big project started on the Isle of Rum with the Nature Conservancy Council, uh, now known as, as Nature Scott. And birds were collected. Um, you can see here two chicks in a nest. One chick would be taken. The adults would carry on feeding the uh, the remaining chick. Um, and would just carry on as normal. They don't seem able to count. And then that uh, chick that was collected would be taken and, and flown across to Scotland by the RAF or the Norwegian Air Force. Have the next one. And some birds were uh, satellite tagged. Some had wing tags, so we could identify them from a distance. Uh, the satellite tagging, in a way, took over from, uh, from that. And they would be taken to Avery's um, initially on the Isle of Rum, then in Westeros in the 90s, and finally uh, to the east coast of N. Fife, right up until 2012. But, so what happened next? Well, in the 1980s, the first pairs started to be seen. 
Um, this was really exciting times for the for the project team. And it wasn't just RSPB, it was uh, Nature Conservancy Council and other partners, landowners, farmers, communities, all get, getting involved in this. The first nests were beginning to be seen um, and found. And finally, uh, 1984, some eggs were laid. I was lucky enough to be here on Mull as part of that team uh, protecting the nest. Uh, the male of that pair wasn't mature and the eggs didn't hatch. Um, but finally, in 1985, we had our first chick. And I think here's an image of that first chick taken way back um, in 1985. A, a bit blurry, a bit black and white, but it was historic. Um, and it's wonderful to see that. And hopefully we'll have a little treat towards the end, um, a little bit more information on that. Um, this picture was taken in 1985 by uh, Chris Gomesall. But, you know, some of those old threats and, and problems were still with us moving forward. And we partner with Police Scotland and help to form a project called Mull Eagle Watch, very much community led, again, working with landowners and farmers to try and help safeguard these uh, first pioneering pairs. But the next slide shows that some of those problems um, haven't gone away and we rely on the police a lot to help us uh, get through the issues that sometimes still face these eagles. And the next slide shows that, yeah, they some birds, eagles, they are still facing some problems. The, the old problems of persecution have not entirely gone away and the issues over accusations of, of, of land predation. And it is all about adapting to learning to live with this big predator. Um, and in some areas they can cause issues. So Nature Scott has a, a great, very positive management scheme, which helps reward farmers who are learning to adapt uh, to live with, with eagles again. But some of the old problems of persecution are very much still there. This is White G, top right, um, alive and well and living on Mull in his first winter. And sadly, that's White G, bottom right, um, having flown east um, onto an estate where he fed on a poisoned uh, hare carcass. And all around him on all the fence posts were poisoned uh, portions of roe deer venison. So he really didn't stand a chance. Um, and this was a bird that we had nurtured and cherished and protected um, throughout his time in the nest. Um, and uh, there he, there, that's where he ended his days. And sadly, it's not just sea eagles, of course. Bottom left is a golden eagle, which we'll be hearing um, from Ian um, in, in the next few minutes. So <clears throat> looking ahead, we um, well, formed Mull Eagle Watch, which started off as a nest protection scheme, but very quickly started to move into uh, public viewing, just like you do with ospreys in, in many cases. We can see in the next one, the public absolutely uh, loved the, the experience. It, for many, it was the first time they would see uh, eagles in the wild, and they were able to help pay for uh, seasonal ranger posts, like the next slide. We would employ uh, people for six months a year to come and help guide, give people a great experience. Sometimes community projects themselves, um, as we see in the next image, took over. So Northwest Mull Community Woodland, there's lots of community ownership now on the Isle of Mull, and Northwest Mull have, have run their own scheme. And as we see with the next one, the Southwest Mull and Iona Development uh, also uh, ran a project at their project uh, community forest that they own uh, down at Tiroran um, and all sorts of open days and events surrounding the eagles making them very much a part of of community life. Schools would visit and uh, be a highlight of their year coming to the eagle hide to hear the ranger talk about the eagles and again help build eagle nests and look through telescopes and generally have a good time. Also, the policy and advocacy side of things, we would invite uh, politicians from all parties to come and visit. This is our local MP, uh, Brendan O'Hara. Then there's the celebrities, and it all helps with raising the profile of the bird and the project, the island. It gets mull and eagles um, into the public domain. Everyone from Blue Peter, uh, Damon Olbarn, Lucy Cook and Steve Batchel. We also see 
the watches uh yolo williams um and country file have all been with us and hamza just lives just across the water from here um came to do a, a project for channel four and uh bought martin clunes with him the one show have been very uh supportive of us uh, they've sent Mike Dilger and Ollie and Nadim from Flock Together, um, RSVB ambassadors, and it all just helps all sorts of, not just wildlife programs. We've had Kate Humble, uh, Susan Kalman has done a tour um, of, of Mal looking at the Eagles and Steve Brown and Channel 5. So it's also important if we look at the next slide or two, uh, to the award ceremonies. Next one, please. Um, it's great. It's a great feeling to see this bird up on the big screen um, with a big audience. Everything from the Nature of Scotland Awards, uh, that's now open for entries for the 2023 um, award ceremony, um, and the Highlands and Islands Tourism Awards. The project uh, has won awards like this, and it really helps put white toed eagles on the centre stage. We can see from the next one that it also brings community benefits. You know, when people come on trips, they contribute to a, an Eagle Fund, and that then goes back to the local community. Sometimes up to £10,000 a year goes out to small community groups, and it helps fund community projects that are nothing particularly to do with wildlife or eagles. They can help restore the war memorial in Tobermory or buy a new church bench or help repair the, the snooker table at the youth club. Um, all sorts of things. It's great too to see local businesses um, popping up, as we can see. Boat trips, wildlife tours, um, mull charters here do a boat trips and do a great job and get you really up close and personal um, with the birds and well worth doing that trip. And even all sorts of other local businesses. It's really heartwarming to see other things such as Whitetail Gin draws its inspiration uh, from the uh, amazing white tail eagle so just to shout out to the the partners who've helped get us where we are really nature scott um do so much to help protect this bird La forestry and land scotland i work with uh, on almost a daily basis as a lot of the birds love to nest in their forests police scotland just outstanding in their response and we've had several prosecutions where people have disturbed sea eagles um, and overseeing it all the marlon iona community trust so it also benefits um, projects. Just a quick example of, of how it does that with Craig Newer Golf Club, uh, which was uh, one of the host sites for uh, Mal Eagle Watch. And as we can see, we do we did the wildlife tours, people would pay, and that money would then go back to the golf club to help them with uh, buying new kit and equipment. It all helps. Um, every, all the publicity helps. If you can see the next one, please. Uh, they, the, the golf club itself gets a little mention and, and in the national media as well. So that's been the past and the present. And what about the future? Well, this is perhaps the most exciting thing of all and an amazing project founded by the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation and Forestry England. Um, and now with a bit of help from RSPB and others helping to collect chicks, we're now able to do for England, what the Norwegians did for us really back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the, the birds here are doing well enough that we can help supply Roy and his team um, in England with birds from Scotland. Four birds have gone down from Mull. Um, and you can see they travel, travel far and wide. Um, and it's great though that they are really treating the south of England um, as home and they're drifting back there and uh, that's where we're hoping now to see new pairs forming um, over the next few years. So again, a chick from a, a brood of two would be taken, the adults carry on feeding, and the other birds are, are taken down to the Forestry England area on the Isle of Wight and released a few weeks later. So very encouraging early signs for that project. And I think, yeah, it is it's inspiring thing to be part of and just very exciting to see what the next uh, few years bring. So I think we're nearly there. If we can just go to the next bit. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege for me to be part of uh, bringing white-toed eagles back to Britain. It's 
it's, it's given me so much and from a career and a family life here on Mull um, and and just to be part of this bird's daily life um, is a true honour. So I mentioned a little treat earlier that I hope um, will work this time. Um, we're thanking all the different people, many people who gave us uh, permission to use their images. This footage, um, if we can play it, shows that first chick in 1985. You know, this footage was lost uh, to all of us for nearly 40 years. It has not seen the light of day. Um, it was taken in 1985 by the RSVB film unit, uh, Ian McCarthy, cameraman, and Chris Gomesall, photographer. And they came up to, to film, really, for posterity, that, that first chick to see, to make sure we had it on record. And then the footage was lost, but we did finally track it down to Channel 4 News, who'd run it as an exclusive in 1985, um, and we've been able to salvage it, and just as a little bit of posterity, really, to see that, that young bird that we fretted over and lost sleep over and protected. You know, it was the first bird chick for nearly 100 years. This is his mum, uh, Blondie, as she was known, the real matriarch of the population. Um, we wouldn't be where we are today without her and, and her productivity. Um, and just lovely to see this footage again um, as the young chick finally trying out those big eight foot wingspans, a bit wobbly at times, but eventually coming into land. And uh, yeah, wonderful to be part of that story and to see how far they've come. The eagle really has landed. So that's me. Um, we're going to be back a little bit later for some questions and answers after Ian's presentation uh, but for now thank you for listening and thank you Claire for helping me get through that thank you Dave that was that was brilliant um, and really amazing to see that video at the end I do remember seeing my own first white-tailed eagle on mole many years ago as it flew alongside a car and being absolutely blown away by the sheer size of the thing um, so, uh, oh, just to say, do remember to put your questions. There are a few come in already, but um, just as, as you think of them, stick them in the Q&A box and we'll get to, in, uh, get to answer those at the end. Now, to introduce Ian. So Ian is originally from Aberdeen um, and he's spent 15 years working, oh, he did spend 15 years working as the warden at Abilady Bay Local Nature Reserve in East Lothian before joining the RSPB's investigations team in 2006. And he's overseen the work of that team there in Scotland since 2012. Um, and away from the job, he's a, he's a very, very keen birder, as I'm sure you can imagine. But he also says that he's an average wildlife photographer, I'm sure that's not true, and a very slow cyclist, uh, that I can believe. Um, so uh, thank you, Ian, and definitely over to you. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, good afternoon, folks. Uh, I am on the opposite side of Scotland from Dave. I'm in Fife, where the weather is equally dreig and dire this afternoon. Anyway, let's crack on. I will share my screen as well, and we can make a start. <clears throat> so, as was said in introduction, my role in RSPB is dealing with wildlife crime. Uh, not a particularly pleasant subject, but one I will be reflecting on today as it is an important part of the Golden Eagle story. As much as anything, just like what we've heard from Dave, this is another story of a journey that has lasted many years, but I hope by the end of my presentation, you'll be feeling optimistic for the future of these fabulous birds as well. Let's be positive. Golden Eagles on the way up. Golden eagles are absolutely magnificent. I'm not going to get into a my eagles are better than your eagles conversation because both white tails and goldens are fantastic and Dave is fortunate in that he has both on the island of Mull, whereas in Fife we only have very occasional visits from eagles. But golden eagles epitomise everything that's wonderful about our wildest countryside. Perhaps this wide open spaces, rugged mountainsides, solitudes and escape from the everyday hustle and bustle. They live in our remotest places and because of that, yes, obviously they are difficult to see. Um, and often 
you'll only see a distant speck soaring above a ridge. But that, to me, just adds something to their aura and, and their awesomeness. They are big birds, not as huge as, as the white-tailed eagles we just heard about, but still pretty sizable. Their wingspan is, is over two metres, or if, like me, you, you still deal with old money, we're talking about nearly seven feet. So that's a pretty, pretty sizable bird. And that means they can catch a wide range of prey, ranging from things like hares, as you, you maybe saw in Wild Isles the other night, rabbits, grouse, even young deer if they get the chance. And they also eat a great deal of carrion. So it's often you will see them beside a festering carcass on a hillside. Their, their eyesight is incredible and they spend a lot of time soaring very, very high, hence the speck above a ridge. Or sometimes they'll perch on a good vantage point until they spot potential prey. I mentioned that, uh, or, or Martin mentioned I was an average wildlife photographer. Well, this is one of my pictures. The previous two have been, have been others, but this is why it's a bit fuzzy. A good identification clue to golden eagles is, of course, their size. But of course, if they're not beside another bird, that can be quite a difficult thing to gauge. Another clue is to work out if a soaring bird of uh, prey is an eagle or a buzzard, is to count the feather tips at the end of the wing, or sometimes they're known as the fingers. An eagle has six, while a buzzard only has five. And th these are really two of the main confusion species, golden eagle and buzzard. Lots of people claim to have seen golden eagles as they're driving about the highlands of Scotland. But in most cases, it's likely to be a buzzard. A good rule of thumb is that if it's sitting on a fence post at the side of the road, it's almost certainly going to be a buzzard. So what about a bit more about the birds? They don't usually breed until they're about three or four years old, and they're seldom successful in the early years. Dave mentioned the first breeding attempt to white-tailed eagles by immature birds wasn't successful. That, well, that's very similar with, with golden eagles. They nest on crags, or in some cases in trees, and tree nests are often in mature Scots pines, a bit like the one in, in the pictures here. Eagles are interesting in that they will use the same nest or maybe one or two alternative nests within their territory year after year after year, and material is added every year. And with golden eagles, certainly always the finishing touch is a layer of fresh green vegetation. And in this particular case, you can see some pine branches which act as a sort of nest liner. And that's added just before the eggs are laid. This, of course, means that nests can become huge over the years. And that often, unfortunately, leads to them eventually collapsing under the weight of material added. Um, golden eagles will usually lay a couple of eggs. One's laid a day or two before the other. Uh, and when food is short, often only the oldest chick will survive the fledging age. In plentiful years, both chicks will fledge and in some families of triplets, but prey has to be very, very abundant in those circumstances. The pictures here are from a camera that we installed at a nest site where we were concerned it was potentially going to be targeted by folk who perhaps wished to do the birds some harm. Uh, the nest actually did fail uh, this particular year back in 2013, but not because of anything bad happening, fortunately, but for no other reason, and the birds seemed to get fed up incubating. I wonder perhaps if because there was snow very close to the cup of the nest, it got chilled in its very, very early days, and perhaps that caused the egg not to hatch. But uh, it was unsuccessful, this particular breeding attempt, um, but for natural causes. Unfortunately, however, um, golden eagles do fall victim to crimes all too regularly. And I want to talk a wee bit about that for the next few minutes. Fifteen years ago, a significant document known as the Golden Eagle Framework was published. And that document was a, a comprehensive analysis of issues that were potentially impacting on the bird's population. The Golden Eagles virtually disappeared from England and Wales in the 19th century, 
there was a pier that did cling on in the Lake District until around 20, 25 years ago. And the last breeding pier in Northern Ireland was back in the 1950s. So by and large, we're talking in recent history, at least, about golden eagles being pretty much confined to Scotland. The golden eagle framework was a study that pulled together all that was known about things like habitat and food availability, the spread of forestry, wind farms and disturbance. And what it concluded was that in much of the remaining range, golden eagles were, were really struggling quite badly over much of eastern and southern Scotland. And you can see from the map, the red areas is where it had a really poor con uh, conservation status. Um, in these areas, it was identified that the population was being constrained by the illegal killing of these birds. And sadly, our experience in the investigations team at RSPB really did reflect this. These numbers make grim reading. Uh, the picture is of the latest incident we know of, a young golden eagle that was found dead next to the remains of a mountain here on a moor in Aberdeenshire almost exactly two years ago. The hare, which is just out of picture, had been laced with a banned pesticide and it had been deliberately put out in the open to kill things. Now, we don't know what the perpetrator was intending to kill, whether it was foxes or crows or buzzards or eagles. It doesn't matter. The practice of putting poison bait out in the open has been illegal for over 100 years. And of course, the figure of 96 golden eagles that we've had confirmed as being illegally killed in the UK is just what has been found. These crimes take place in really remote areas where witnesses are few and far between, and it's very easy to dispose of evidence if you're the perpetrator. So we're only actually finding a fraction of the crimes that are going on. We're going to do a quick poll just now to ask what proportion of these crimes you think are actually detected. Of course, it's not just golden eagles that are being killed. It's buzzards, it's red kites, it's peregrines, it's hen harriers, it's white-tailed eagles and other birds of prey, all of which have been protected by law for decades. We know of over 3,000 birds of prey that have been illegally killed across the UK since 1982. In answer to our poll though, we don't know what proportion we're detecting, given these incidents are happening unseen in the middle of nowhere. It's certainly not even close to 100%. We know there are efforts to cover up evidence of these crimes, and we know that we're only scratching the surface with the ones that we do uncover. But in Scotland, where nearly all of our golden eagles live, we also know that the distribution of detected rat to persecution incidents shows a marked bias to the east and the south of the country. And you may wonder why this is. A significant majority of rat to persecution incidents occur on land being managed intensively for driven grouse shooting where flocks of grouse are driven towards a line of gun by beaters. But why on earth should that be linked to persecution? Driven grouse muirs require a huge density of grouse achieved by intensive habitat management, like heather burning to give a mosaic of different age structures of heather, the medicating of grouse to reduce disease and parasites, and of course, predator control. Now, that, that's perfectly legal with regard to crows, foxes, stoats, and weasels, for example aiming to produce a suitable surplus of grouse to be killed come the 12th of August. But in many such areas, unfortunately, raptors who may eat a few grouse or disturb a shoot are also routinely, illegally eradicated. 
Now, this link between driven grouse shooting and crime against birds of prey is well proven, and organisations like RSPB have been campaigning for many years for regulation of grouse moors to make them more accountable. Against this background, though, how do you think our golden eagles are doing? Now, this is a species that obviously lives in, in, in wild areas, uh, but the population is surveyed approximately every 10 years. And you certainly see through the 80s and 90s and then into the early noughties, the population is quite stable. Then the 2015 survey took place. And what that showed was actually some good news indeed. Apparently, golden eagles doing quite well with a 15% rise in the population. And indeed, in much of the north and west, they are thriving, with populations doing very well in places like Mull and the Western Isles. But you'll remember a, a, a wee while ago, I mentioned traditional nest sites. There is a pretty big disparity between the occupation of traditional territories mirroring where raptors are being killed and highlighting the impact these crimes have, population, have at population level. Remember the map? So only just over a third of traditional territories occupied in the east of Scotland compared to 95, 89, 92% in the west. So it's a mixed picture, but towards the end of the, the noughties, things had already begun to change in the story. You'll remember what I said earlier about lack of witnesses in, in remote areas, but between about 2005 and 2010, something new began to happen. And that was technology which began to change the rules. And over the last 15 years, satellite transmitters fitted to young birds of prey have begun to give us an unprecedented insight into their lives as they move around the countryside, making unseen journeys that we could now track from our desk. We now have a witness as to what's going on. And the technology began to tell us where eagles were being killed satellite transmitters giving a static signal told us where illegal poisoning was going on. Now, in actual fact, satellite tagging has had a marked impact. As, could, as you can see in this graph, what they've done is to make poisoning much more detectable and increase the chances of a poisoner being caught, even if that was just, just a little bit greater chance. But the other thing is the stories about these dying birds were catching the eyes of our politicians. And, and in 2012, we had a new law in Scotland called vicarious liability, making landowners responsible for the actions of their employees. And that certainly helped keep poisoning at a much lower level than it had been previously. But although poisoning cases were declining, the criminals were still using other methods to kill raptors and hiding the evidence. And as a result, many satellite tagged birds of prey were just disappearing. In August 2012, RSPB put out a press release after the eighth tagged golden eagle disappeared suddenly and suspiciously in just one small area of hills, entirely managed for grouse shooting over five years. The Scottish Government response was an important next step. To, commit, to commission a major piece of independent research analysing the fates of satellite tagged golden eagles in Scotland. That research report was published in May 2017 and the results put beyond any doubt what was happening to these birds, confirming what we'd been seeing for many years. Around a third of young tagged eagles were disappearing in suspicious circumstances, largely in areas managed as grouse moors, and persecution of young eagles was suppressing the golden eagle population in the central and eastern highlands. There have been two very good bits of good news though. First of all, legislation to license grouse moor management was introduced in the Scottish Parliament just last week. When this becomes law, where evidence is found linking landholdings to legal killing of birds of prey, they risk losing the right to shoot grouse. We think that this will be a major deterrent to raptor persecution, and we hope that our eagle population now has a real chance to take off. The second good bit, bit of good news is that South Scotland's Golden Eagle Project, which 
for the last few years has been translocating young golden eagles from nests elsewhere in Scotland to boost the tiny populations of Scottish borders with a couple of birds. These eagles are thriving and wandering widely with many sightings across the border. There is now the very real prospect that we might even see golden eagles nesting in the north of England in the next few years. And just two days ago, one of my colleagues saw a golden eagle in Northern Ireland, possibly a bird from the south of Scotland or the Irish reintroduction programme. Wouldn't it be absolutely fantastic if in the next few years, golden eagles were again breeding across the four countries of the UK? That would be a real conservation success story. Anyway, Many thanks to you for your time and for listening, and we'll move on to the Q&A. Thanks, Ian. Um, it's fascinating, really eye-opening. Um, a bird I wish I'd seen more of, but um, when you do see them, yeah, it's, it's always a special, special moment. Um, so, if you've got any more questions, especially for Ian, um, stick them in the Q&A box and I will now ask Dave to put his camera and uh, microphone back on um, and we can uh, go through some of these questions. There's quite a lot, so we will do our best to get through as many as possible and um, yeah, Dave and Ian will try and keep the answers relatively short but with all the relevant um, detail. So um, one for Dave from Fiona, um, how long on average do white-tailed eagles um, live? Certainly <clears throat> well into their 20s um, and there's some actual some record holders here Sky and Freezer who are the famous white-tailed eagles um, that Springwatch and others have, have featured and we know Sky the male there um, is 28 years old last year and we were able to read his ring um, Jim Manthorpe the Springwatch cameraman actually captured that so we know for sure it's him and the British Trust for Ornithology have confirmed that he's now officially the oldest uh, white-tailed eagle in Britain so yeah 28 30 is just about possible wow that's um that's uh yeah an old old, old bird um so one on golden eagles for Ian, um, any plans to reintroduce golden eagles into the south of England? Not that I'm aware of. Um, there is probably no reason why golden eagles couldn't live in the south of England. I mean, obviously, we, we associate them with wild, mountainous areas. And, and certainly, arguably, they do live in more remote patches away from humans and whether there is enough of that space available in, in the south of England others will know better than I. I'm certainly not aware of any plans but here's hoping that eventually they will spread to all available habitats in England and, and Wales, why not Wales as well, from the south of Scotland population in years to come. Yeah it would be something wouldn't it. Um, another one for Dave and um, the slides at the beginning you had um i think a, a carving on a pictish tomb um and i was just we also um heather was wondering whether that meant that um white-tailed eagles were maybe tamed and used for for hunting at all is there any evidence for that very interesting that um Actually, it was a Pictish stone, and then there was a separate Tomb of the Eagles, which, which is from Neolithic times. Um, I don't think there is evidence of that. I mean, white-toed eagles are probably not the, the best falconer's bird. They will sit and wait and watch for, for hours sometimes. And if you're a falconer who uh, is after prey and, and wants action, then maybe white-toed eagles are not the bird for you. So I would doubt that they were used for that purpose. But there's certainly a belief that they were very much held in high esteem uh, by early man and probably did follow him around and scavenge off him as he made kills and and uh, so on. And so they've been scavenging off mankind since Neolithic times. OK, um, another one for you, Dave, just because I think it's an important one, um, you know, to be to talk about, be transparent about with reintroductions. Uh, Brock is asking about, you know, what are the real facts and the impacts of um, eagles predating on lambs? And I guess for both species, so it's not just Dave, um, Ian as well. And, you know, how well have conservationists engaged with farmers in, in doing the conservation recovery work? 
Yeah, there's there's constant liaison and, and part of stakeholder groups and so on ac across Scotland at the moment. Um, and I know the White-tailed Eagle project for England did huge amounts of, of uh, consultation with farming industry and with local communities before any consideration was given to releasing them. And that work has led on to schemes, like I mentioned, the Nature Scots e Eagle Management Scheme, uh, which is a very positive. It, it doesn't come, it's not compensation. It doesn't compensate for loss of lands because nobody could ever really agree what was healthy or sick or dead or alive. But it does help farmers adapt to life with these birds again, um, which could involve indoor lambing. It could be health treatments for for lambs and sheep to make them less vulnerable to predation. So it's all about adaptive management. Yeah. OK. Um, so I'm just looking through. God, we've got so many questions. Um, so one thought, Ian, I guess, with your investigations um, hat on, um, you, well, there was, a, I think it was in Dave's um, presentation at the beginning, but um, of relevance to you, um, there was a picture of a poison bait, uh, an eagle that had been killed at a, at a poison bait. Um, and this related, I guess, to the prosecution for that particular crime. But I guess more generally, um, you know, are many people prosecuted? And then, you know, what are the the levels of uh, punishment that then go with those prosecutions for for um, eagle deaths. Yeah, I mean the picture Dave showed, and he mentioned the poison baits that were found afterwards. I was actually on the search that recovered those, and like many cases, nobody was prosecuted for that incident, awful though it was. And one of the main problems is, as, as I said in my presentation, witnesses are few and far between. And it's very, very difficult to get a sufficiency of admissible evidence presented to a court that can link the poisoning of that bird or the shooting to, of that bird with an identifiable individual to the level of evidence that will stand up to secure a prosecution. And the criminals who want to target our birds of prey know this, and that's why these crimes continue. And so this is why RSPB and others have been campaigning for such a long time to have more meaningful sanctions. The criminal burden of proof is very, very difficult to achieve. Whereas if you use a civil burden of proof, i.e. on balance of probability, it is much, much easier to get links between land holdings and crimes against birds of prey rather than an identifiable individual. To an example, an eagle is poisoned, the police carry out a search under warrant and they found traces of that same poison in a estate Land Rover. You may not be able to identify the individual that's involved, but you can certainly make a clear link given that these pesticides are banned with the land holding. And this is why we have been campaigning for sanctions like the licensing of grouse moors, for example, where the right to shoot could be withdrawn as a sanction rather than an individual facing a criminal um, conviction. This hopefully will be law in Scotland by the summer, and we hope and expect it to have a marked effect on raptor persecution here. Right. Yeah, well, it'd be good to see, I think. Um, a couple of related questions then, I guess. So the sense I'm getting from the questions are people are keen to see more eagles across the UK of both species where appropriate. Um, but a couple of questions about how an increase in, you know, such a impressive predator might have knock on effects on other species uh, more generally. So will it will it negatively impact on other species? And, and then there was another question more detailed around curlew and wimbrel breeding success. So is there any link between increased eagle numbers and decreasing in those sort of threatened wader species? Um, I'll leave it up to you guys to decide who wants to answer that. If I, if I can say one thing, Martin, one of the things that's become very obvious and, and multiple studies have shown this, and, and, and you mentioned curlew, uh, there has been quite an expansion in the number of generalist predators in the UK over many, many decades. We have a, a higher population of species like fox and crow than in comparable countries in Europe. And one of the reasons for that is because 
man has stripped away the top predators, the animals that would predate on them. So, for example, with, with crows, our goshawk population is tiny. And, and in other countries, goshawks have a significant impact on the crow population. Lynx predate foxes, golden eagles, white-tailed eagles potentially predate foxes. So because we now have a fairly knackered um, sort of food chain, what, what we're seeing are the rise of these birds that, are that, that predate birds like the curlew, like the lapwing. Um, if we could have more of the top predators that we target them, then hopefully we'd see a bit more balance in our environment. Yeah, I can't add anything to what Ian said. He's, he's said it all. <laughs> um, so another question here from Mary. Um, and I guess this is relevant because we've just seen the first case, as far as I'm aware, of a Scottish osprey turning up in the New World uh, in Barbados. Um, but this is one. Um, uh, do eagles cross the North Sea or the English Channel? Um, and any exchange from birds from Norway or near continent or elsewhere? I, I can say that talk about that for the whitetails. I mean, Roy Dennis and Forestry England's project um, has shown some remarkable movements of, of birds, um, including one individual that, that crossed the channel and headed up into Norway, got as far as Sweden, I think, as well, and and then eventually has made its way back. So, yes, they do cross big air, big sections of water. Golden eagles, I think, probably less so. White-tailed eagles are just great wanderers in their first five years they go far and wide. Uh, but the really encouraging thing is that those birds are coming home. Um, even birds from England that have come back to Scotland and we think, oh goodness, they're all coming back. They're not, they're turning around and going back to the South Coast. So really encouraging. And hopefully they'll start to mix with, with European birds as well and, and attract the odd bird across from Germany and the Netherlands where they're doing quite well. Yeah, no, and that actually links to another a question that we had mainly about possibilities of inbreeding in both species so I think Dave's answered that for white-tailed eagles that we may be seeing at least over time birds moving back and I know I, I live um, in East Anglia and we occasionally get birds from continental populations of white-tailed eagles um, popping over so there'll be some um, in uh, some breeding between populations but for for golden eagles Ian um, given that we've seen at historically quite small populations and then um, expanding very slowly out. Do we see inbreeding as a, as a problem? I, I don't think there's any evidence of it. I mean, interestingly, it's believed that the, the Western Isles population on the, on the out, Outer Hebrides is, is sort of genetically distinct from the population on the Scottish mainland, and there certainly don't seem to be any inbreeding issues there. In fact, the golden eagle population in the Western Isles is doing phenomenally well alongside the white-tailed eagle population. So although the UK as a whole, its eagle population is pretty isolated, and there is a reintroduction programme going on on the island of Ireland, and it's Scottish birds that have been used to supplement that population. There's certainly no evidence that, that, that there is an inbreeding issue at this stage, and, and long may that continue. Yeah. And for, for white-tailed eagles, Dave, a um, couple of questions about uh, plans to reintroduce them into East Anglia. Um, do we know what the latest on that is? Um, I, I suspect the, the team are, are waiting a few more years yet just to see how it's going to be doing on the Isle of Wight. Uh, really encouraging early signs, generally good survival, apart from a couple of very public cases of poisoning, unfortunately, um, on shooting estates in Dorset and in West Sussex. But overall, survival has been good. Um, but we know from the Scottish experience, you have to get a lot of birds out there because there will be natural losses as well. Of course, um, of course. And so, yeah, they've got to keep going. I think that 60 birds over five years, roughly, um, is the target. And uh, it's it's looking very encouraging at the moment. So I suspect that will be the, the future for a year or two yet before they look elsewhere. Yeah. And then just a couple of questions on the practicalities of the conservation work, I guess. Um, so someone asking about the age of chicks or young birds when they're moved from the nest for translocation. And then a sort of a, a more sort of thoughtful and practical question around um, 
obviously you mentioned that um, eagles quite often have two chicks and when food is limited then only one chick survives is it possible to take the smaller chick at those points and and um feed you know feed that adopt take it into care and then use that as part of the the future release program too i think certainly with regard to the goal that eagles that that is is what's happening they, they are taking one chick from this with twins um and and it's those that are that are being used in the the south scotland golden eagle project that's not it's important point to make actually with regard to that project that's not a reintroduction it's what's called a, a population reinforcement project there has been a very small population of golden eagles two to four pairs in the south of scotland for for many years and going back to your previous question about inbreeding, that was a concern in that area because, interestingly, that population seemed to be isolated from the population north of the central belt. We only had one recorded satellite tag bird moving from the south of Scotland to the north ever across the central belt between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And just that flat land and all the big city and urban landscape potentially was acting as a deterrent to their movement. So that project has taken young chicks from the north of Scotland. Prior to them fledging, they're, they're reared much like the White Tail Legal Project taking chicks from Norway originally. The, the birds are reared to fledging in aviaries, trying to minimise the view and, and the contact with man. And when they reach fledging age, the door is open and they're, they're, they're given supplementary feeding uh, for a few weeks thereafter until they can be sure they can make it on their own. But uh, both projects have, ha, are now well proven. There is a lot of experience in, in Scotland and elsewhere with these these moving of evil chicks and it's, it's happening very, very successfully. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, one last question and it's a yes or no answer to you, Ian. Has anyone ever gone to prison for killing an eagle? No. No, right. Well, on that quite um, sad note, but thank you. Um, well, that's all we've got time for today. Um, and I hope uh, you all enjoyed that. I thank you so much for taking time out to, to join us. Um, I found that incredibly interesting and informative, and I hope you have too. Um, as mentioned earlier, there'll be a short survey that will pop up on your screens once the webinar is closed. And we really love to get your feedback. It's really important for us to find out, you know, um, how we can improve from seminar to seminar. I just obviously want to thank uh, David and Ian for an absolutely fantastic set of talks and videos. Um, thanks, guys. Really, really uh, happy that you work for us. Um, and then just more generally, we have two webinars left in our Wild Isles series. Um, on the 4th of April, we'll be hearing about two of our most important wetland reserves, Ham Wall in uh, Somerset and Fen Drayton, which is not too far from me in Cambridgeshire. And in our last webinar of the series on the 13th of April, we'll be hearing from Laura Bambini and Zoe Deacon on their work with Manx Shearwaters and Storm Petrels. So that will be good too. Um, and the link to register for both of those uh, will be included in the survey that pops up at the end. So just remains for me to say uh, thanks again, Ian and David. Thank you for audience for attending and um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>